Uh, hello, Jet Sunma. Um, there's many nuns here today, and that's quite rare for these many nuns to get together. Um, in Australia, the Buddhist community is not very united. Most people don't even want to call themselves Buddhist. And uh, Western Tibetan monastics often have this situation where a great deal is expected of them from the lay community. They're kind of like social workers slash psychologists. Um, but there isn't a lot of financial support for that. We have a 75% disrobing rate. Um, and also, Tibetan lamas are supported and Western monastics are not. Um, we don't have one centre in Australia that doesn't charge monastics in some way, West, Western monastics in some way, shape or form. And the people who disrobe the most are usually people below 50. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, if we neither have a lot of support from Tibetan lamas emotionally and spiritually, and we also don't have a lot of support from the lay community, but a lot, of ex a lot is expected from us. And we are also divided by um, individualism and... Uh, sectarianism. Um, so, you know, we can, we lose faith, we have doubts, we become emotionally burnt out. And Buddhism, you know, we don't have the, this really strong faith of someone who's, you know, Buddh the Buddhist culture is all around them. Um, for, for those of us who face these challenges, although many of us also probably feel a lot of inspiration sometimes too, uh, could you offer some inspiration about how we can support each other, how we can change our situation, how we could work together for a better future? She said it. She said it. I mean, as I was saying yesterday, for those of you who were attending yesterday's evening talk, it is very, very difficult for monastics, Western and other Asian monastics not, who are not Himalayan, but ordained in the Tibetan tradition. And it's especially difficult for the females, for the nuns, uh, because first of all, there is no support from the Tibetan side, uh, from their lamas and the monasteries, and also there is very little support or appreciation from uh, their own uh, Western lay followers who don't really appreciate what they are doing, of what they're trying to do, what their needs are. And while Tibetan lamas, if they come, are all formed over like anything, um, the, the Western monastics are generally overlooked and totally neglected. And so they get discouraged. And uh, as a result, as uh, Ayashi says, that the dropout rate is, is very high. It's not that they don't want to be nuns, but they want to be nuns. They don't want to have to go out to work and put on lay clothes and then come back in the evening and put their robes on just to remind themselves they have vows. They don't want to be uh, treated, uh, you know, like they're of no, you know, they're there to run things, but, you know, beyond that, nobody's going to help them or support them. They're only running things for helping some lama who's living in India or Nepal. And, you know, they gave up the, the, their lay life in order to devote themselves to study and to practice and to live a monastic life. And it's been very, very difficult for many of them to sustain this because there is simply no support either, not just financial, but also psychological. So I would say stick in there, girls. <laughs> because despite everything, it is such... Uh, I mean, the one thing I... I mean, with all my faults and failings, the one thing I'm truly grateful to myself for was that at the age of 20, I knew I wanted to be a nun, and I did it. Um, and I'm very grateful for myself for that. And um, so with all the problems and all the difficulties and all the humiliations which come along with this role, there are nonetheless, it is, an, if we have the karma for it, then it is, we're upholding the Buddha Dharma in our, our, just by being. For example, I mean, as, as uh, Sama Elin often says, when, when we go abroad, like, you know, we're wandering around in, in, like, France or Germany, people come up and say, oh, you're a Buddhist nun, and they're so excited. 
And you know, they, they start telling us all what they've been doing or what they're not doing and who they met or they saw the Dalai Lama once and they're, and they're so excited, you know. And it's made their day for them. And one time I was in Thailand, in Chiang Mai, and, and this old Thai man came up and he said, you're a bhikkhuni? And I said, yes, I'm a bhikkhuni. And he just tears streamed down his face. He said, now I can die. I have met the fourfold Sangha. So, you know. Yes, dear. As women, for our Asian sisters, come, the what? Yeah, I, I think we we go on in the West or in Western culture about how difficult it is, and yes, it is difficult. But in Asian countries, women suffered so much more ordained women than what we do. Yeah, but usually as a community. Sometimes, not all the time. But they didn't complain like we do. I think we're but they didn't have to go out to work. They didn't necessarily have to go out to work, but their physical work was so much harder than what ours is these days. No, I think it's a different thing. I, I disagree. Oh. I mean, I know the Maichis, for example, had a, a really tough time. Mm. And, but, you know, they're used to that. That's part of who they were in the villages. You know, they didn't expect anything more. But they and didn't complain about it, No, they? they didn't complain because they weren't expecting anything more. Mm. But these women are highly educated. They're, many of them are highly professional women. Mm. They live completely different lives, and they chose to give that all up for the sake of the Dharma. Yeah. But there's no support system to hold them. Whereas in, the, in Asia, all right, so you're a Meiji, so you're down with the ants, compared with the, the, the bhikkhus who are like gods. But that's part of their social system. Mm. They, they, they recognize that. They know that when they're going to become Meiji, mm. that they're going to be despised by the lay people. And it doesn't worry them because anyway, you know, probably back in their villages, that was the kind of life they led anyway. Mm. Whereas these are very different kind of women. They're not, I mean, I... I'm educating all these Himalayan girls, yeah. right? Yeah. And I know very well that up until very, very recently, uh, the nuns there were treated, you know, and when we first started, the nuns, uh, when they had uh, ceremonies, the monks were inside the temple, the lay people are outside the temple, and the nuns had to be with the lay people, right? Mm. Then at a certain point, um, my lama uh, called up and said, look, it's not right, the nuns are outside, you bring the nuns inside the temple. Mm. So then I said to the nuns, okay, girls, let's go inside the temple. So they all crawled in, looking very worried, and there were the carpets that the monks sit on. So then a monk was rolling up the carpet, and I said to him, well, no, the nuns now are coming in. The Rinpoche said the nuns should come in, so you please... Uh, you know, they can't sit on the cold floor. Please put the carpet out for the nuns. Oh, sorry, Anila, but carpet, uh, Kampaga, this is the name of the monastery, Kampaga custom, only monks can sit on carpet. Very sorry, Kampaga custom. So I said, okay, you change the custom. Now we have new custom, Kampaga monks and Kampaga nuns sit on the carpet. Mm. And he thought about that, and he looked at everybody else, and they shrugged. And so then they put out the carpet. And now when the nuns go, they sit actually the row of monks, then the nuns, and then more rows of monks behind. <laughs> but they were perfectly happy to stay outside, mm. you know, because they felt that was their role with nuns. They know nuns were looked down on. And so they naturally assumed that they would be looked down on. Mm. But these are women who have had, you know, prominent roles in their lives. They're not coming from the same background at all. No, and they're not complaining normally at all. That's the problem. So nobody knows. But they do. They're complaining today because I'm getting them to complain. <laughs> uh. 
normally they're so quiet that all the people are coming and saying, we didn't know this, because they don't talk about it. You know, they're actually very shy to talk about their situation and how much they're, they're overlooked and under-supported. Good. Yeah. <laughs> More complaints, the better, I say, because really nothing's going to change unless you push it. Unless people realize there's a problem, they're not going to look for the solution. And those, the way the nuns are treated in Theravada monasteries is disgusting. And just being acquiescent to that doesn't change the... the you know, some people like Dhammananda, who have stood up and said, this is enough of that, you know, and as in Sri Lanka likewise, good for them, I say. You know, let people recognize that this is total discrimination and totally against what the Buddha intended. The Buddha said the fourfold Sangha, he never just said monks. He said the fourfold Sangha, meaning the monastics, male and female, lay people, lay men, lay women, all the fourfold Sangha should study, practice, propagate the Dharma. Then the Dharma would flourish. He nowhere says, oh monks, only you can study and practice and the rest of them can spend their life supporting you. Isn't it? So we're just going back to what the Buddha wanted. And if you don't tell people there's a problem, they will know. So it's, it's a valid complaint. It's not that they're being moany groany, but they're pointing out the discrepancy, which is not right, because, I mean, the lamas are doing very well. It's not like they're... They've been 60 years refugees. You know, when are they still going to be refugees? Why don't they support themselves? Isn't it? So we need to, to let people know that there is a problem. You know, previously the nuns were overlooked. Now nuns are getting better. But, you know, there are all these non-Himalayan nuns who are still overlooked. It's time that they open their eyes and said, oh, hey, look, we've got all these wonderful, highly educated, highly articulate women that we've completely ignored and shunted to the back of the, the pecking order. Maybe it's time we, we paid them some attention, trained them properly, helped them, encouraged them, and set them up uh, to really uh, help with, propagate the Dharma. Isn't it? I don't consider that complaint. Oh, thank you, Jet Summer. Um, I'm, I just wanted to hark back to the young girls in your convent who wanted to do the practice, you know, not to procrastinate any longer. And in my life as a grandmother and a, a school teacher, I wondered if it's possible to continue with the joy of, and gratitude of our precious human life while, without looking too miserable and donning the black, to also acknowledge that we're going to die and prepare ourselves for that. Hmm? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. Okay, what I'm saying is, is that yeah. without doing the month-long practice that you were talking about that the young girls in your convent were doing, I wondered, that, yeah, I don't know the name of it, I wondered in my life, yeah. in my Western life, yeah. is, <coughs> is it possible to continue with the joy of living my precious human life and a desire to combine it with preparing myself for death? Absolutely. But I don't know what it is. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, if you have joy in life, that's yeah. a wonderful thing. And, and to spread that joy to everybody you meet is an even more wonderful thing. But to also combine it with preparing. With what? With preparing for, for death. Preparing for death? Why? I mean, you know, I think personally, my feeling about death, since you don't ask me, I will tell you. <laughs> is that it's, to my mind, every time I thought I was going to die, my, my first reaction was, oh, this will be interesting. <laughs> now we will find out what really happens, who is right. <laughs> you know, because everybody has their version of what's going to happen next. Now we're going to find out. It's an adventure, you know? And so there is no need to feel, you know, afraid of that. You know, we've been born, I mean, from a Buddhist perspective, we've been born and died so many times. And anyway, we're all going to die. So why worry? And why not look on it as a, as a really fascinating to see now, really, what actually happens? Isn't it? 
You know, so there's no reason to be depressed about it. I mean, the Buddha said that if we only had to do one meditation in life, it should be meditation on death. But it's not to make us morbid. It's to make us appreciate that we're not dead yet and that we have life and not waste it. 